welcome to the inaugural episode of our new GIST webinar series, AI and Emerging Technologies for Sustainable Future. Um, so, um, so this webinar series, um, we are launching this webinar series where our guest speakers will talk about diverse aspects of emerging technologies. Uh, Along with the introductions uh, to the state of the art technology, we'll also bring holistic discussions on the applications and impact of these technologies and how we can understand, assess, and create the technologies for our collective sustainable future. So before I introduce our speaker today, I'll give a quick introduction of our research institute, uh, GIS, Global Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies. Uh, GIS is an independent, not-for-profit research institution based in Kathmandu, Nepal. GIS promotes and conducts interdisciplinary research to generate credible, salient, and legitimate knowledge that catalyzes a transformative change in the development policies and practices in Nepal and elsewhere. So currently, uh, we, are, we are a newly established research institute, and currently we, we have 17 research fellows, um, five research assistants, and three interns. Uh, so now I'm going to um, very gladly introduce our speaker today, um, Professor Bertram C. Bruce. Uh, we also call him Chief Bruce. Um, so, um, and we could not find a better speaker to start this um, webinar series than him because he has, he doesn't only have a very interesting interdisciplinary trajectory, uh, but he has been working uh, in Nepal uh, along with Le Nepali education. Uh, uh, in Nepal ecosystem for a while now. So he did his PhD in computer science uh, and he will explain when was it. <laughs> and he did his bachelor's in uh, biology because computer, was, computer science was not a field then. And he's one of the like a veteran in artificial intelligence because his research was in AI, um, natural language understanding in particular. And then he uh, was interested to use uh, computer science research in education. Uh, and he had done like extensive uh, research, teaching, um, community work and volunteer work in education sector. And he has published a number of books. Uh, he's a very prolific writer and he has also, uh, you know, taught and uh, volunteered and researched in different uh, countries. And Nepal is one of, I hope his favorite ones because he has been coming here um, uh, in multiple visits, uh, recently as a Fulbright Fellow, uh, and he has also started a Progressive Education Network in Nepal. Um, so, yeah, I would like to really thank him for, and he has always been very generous about giving his time and input in this education ecosystem in Nepal. Um, so, yeah, I would like to thank him for all the contributions he has done in education and innovation ecosystem and in Nepal. And I would again like to thank uh, Thank him today for his time. So now I'm going to pass over this um, um, the session to uh, Professor Chip Bruce. Thank you and namaste. Uh, good evening to all of you in Kathmandu and wherever you may be. Um, it's early morning here in uh, Cape Cod in the USA. Um, I'm very much looking forward to our discussion today, and I, I hope it'll be a discussion that you can ask questions and argue with what I say, um, because um, I always feel like I learn a lot whenever I uh, interact with my uh, colleagues in Nepal. Um, let me um, see if I can share my screen, because I have some slides I'd like to show you. Uh, oh, I, I've... My participant screen sharing is disabled. Um, I think now it is enabled. Uh, you can share, I think. Okay. Ah, I think we're... Um, okay, can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay. So, um, I want to talk today about artificial intelligence. And as Devon said, I, this was my first academic uh, career was in that area. So it, this has been interesting to look back to some of the um, uh, work that I did, which is now 50 years ago, uh, quite, a, quite a while. I'm sure uh, uh, a longer time than many of you have been on this planet. Um, I'll be drawing uh, some from a book called Education's Ecosystems, uh, Learning Through Life, uh, 
particularly that second phrase, learning through life is something that uh, is relevant to my presentation today. But, but I wanted to mention the book also because it, it has a number of examples from Nepal, and I hope you might find um, uh, some of those interesting. Um, so 50 years ago, 51 years ago, I worked on my first uh, artificial intelligence project. It was called Vargas 7. And this um, project was involved with pattern recognition. The idea was we wanted the computer to generate patterns in a predictable way and then uh, see if the another computer program could recognize those patterns. Uh, so for example, if, if you look at these four patterns, uh, you may not see much. I, to me, the bottom two uh, look more similar uh, than the um, top two, uh, but you may see it differently. Um, it's pretty amazing now to think about um, what computers could do back in 1968 compared to what they do today. Uh, these patterns are just black dots on a screen. Uh, they, they're 12 columns and they can only go up 14 high, so that's about 20 something bytes. Uh, today we talk about um, uh, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, petabytes, even more. Uh, so this was just tiny, uh, tiny beginning compared to where we are today. Uh, today, when people think about artificial intelligence, they often think about robots that uh, are powerful and can do many things. Uh, in fact, we often go beyond this image uh, to robots that actually look like people and are indistinguishable from people. When you look at uh, the literature on, uh, in science fiction, uh, TV, movies, novels, uh, artificial intelligence is often portrayed as being powerful, uh, super intelligent, and autonomous. It can, it can operate independently. In fact, that's often the, the drama in these um, fictionalized versions of AI is that the uh, artificial intelligence will develop a mind of its own. It'll be smarter than we are and it will begin to do what it wants and not care about us anymore. So I want to take these three uh, adjectives, powerful, uh, intelligent, autonomous, and examine each of them briefly and see what, see what that tells us about artificial intelligence today and about its future. So the first question was, is, is AI powerful? Uh, some of you may have seen the movie called Minority Report. It came out around 2002, 20 years ago. Uh, it's based on a Philip Dick story from the 1950s. Uh, in Minority Report, a, a policeman uh, uses artificial intelligence to predict who might uh, commit a crime. Uh, one analysis pointed out that of all the gee whiz features of that movie, uh, there, were, there were driverless cars, personalized ads, voice controlled homes, facial and optical recognition, uh, uh, gestural computing, predictive policing, that all of these have actually come true in 20 years. So the science fiction of not so long ago is the reality of today. Um, ah. So uh, science fiction writers have uh, complained about this because reality is moving faster than they can move. Ray Bradbury writes that science fiction itself has remained the same. We've caught up to it. We're a science fiction generation. Ron Schusett says we can't think far enough ahead anymore. The, new developments in artificial intelligence are coming faster than even the fiction writers uh, can imagine. Uh, another movie is a documentary based on uh, AlphaGo. AlphaGo uh, plays the, um, the game of Go, which many people consider to be the most complex 
game that human have, humans have devised. AlphaGo not only plays the game, it learns uh, how to play better, it plays against itself to become better. Um, this is something that back in my day, uh, we sort of dreamed of computers that could play checkers. Uh, chess was off in the future and Go seemed absolutely impossible. But uh, computers aren't just playing games. Uh, in the health field, uh, we're seeing uh, robotic surgery, uh, drug and vaccine development, which of course is very relevant today with the pandemic, uh, studies of genetics diseases, uh, prosthetics that have uh, uh, equaled or out exceeded the performance of the arms and legs we were born with, studies of public health and more. We're now mapping the brain. So the, co the computer is, was seen as a model of the brain, but it also can be used to map the actual brains that we have to study, uh, use functional MRI and other techniques to uh, look at what's going on in the brain as we think. And there are many other areas. I won't bore you with a huge list, but just to mention a few, um, planetary, planetary exploration has become possible in a way that we didn't imagine before. We thought we had to have people there. We now have robots that can do much of what the people would do, uh, and in some ways better. They can collect data, they can collect samples. Um, we have personal assistants that we all rely on on our smartphones or computers, weather and climate studies, studies of biodiversity, uh, works in music, visual arts, narrative, and so on. <clears throat> So why has AI been so successful? Well, there are three big reasons that I can point to. One is just massive amounts of data. Remember I mentioned with that Vargas program from many years ago, <clears throat> the patterns took about 20 bytes uh, to rep be represented. Uh, today we, we talk about uh, terabytes, uh, petabytes, exabytes, and more. Uh, we just have huge amount of information. Second, computation has become much faster, much cheaper. Uh, we can go through all of that data uh, in ways that people couldn't imagine before. And finally, we have machine learning, like with AlphaGo, that these computers um, can not only solve these problems, but they learn how to solve them better the next time. Uh, but this raises fears for many people. Um, I'm making several pop culture references here, but another one is a TV show called Next. Uh, and Next, the, the Next computer is a very powerful AI machine that can learn and it becomes autonomous and it begins to act in its own way that uh, ends up killing people and it creates the drama of the, of the show. Uh, this relates to what some people have called the technological singularity. What if you had an intelligent agent, uh, an AI program that could write AI, that it could write a program that would be artificially intelligent? And what if it could make a program that was even more intelligent than it was? Then its offspring, the second generation AI, could make an even more intelligent computer. And, and each generation would get smarter and smarter. Uh, this would um, create what's been called a runaway reaction where uh, there'd be no stopping, endless self-improvement cycles. There'd be an explosion in intelligence. And people have predicted uh, that might happen in the year 2035, maybe 2040. Uh, many people see it as coming soon and they're uh, yes, frightened. Yes. Uh, hello? Okay. Um, John von Neumann, an early uh, researcher in the cybernetics field, said that he could foresee a day when we'd have a powerful superintelligence that would surpass all of human intelligence. 
Uh, Toby Ord has a new book in which he says that the greatest existential threat to humanity over the next century, it's not the pandemic, it's not climate disruption, it's not loss of biodiversity, it's not uh, uh, income inequality or many things, but it's, it's this a, that a super intelligence will come into being that will uh, um, take over the planet and perhaps decide that humans are redundant, we're no longer necessary. But you don't have to imagine the technological singularity to, to uh, get into this way of thinking. Current artificial intelligence is already has many uh, negatives that I would, I would see. Um, we have weapons that are smart weapons that are uh, not sufficiently controlled. We have cyber warfare. We have surveillance uh, that is um, like nothing we've ever seen on this planet, a loss of privacy. We've created social media bubbles, which have led to uh, uh, radical uh, sex developing with, with crazy ideas. Uh, and we're losing the idea of um, uh, what John Dewey called the public. Uh, we have many publics and these publics are reinforced and furthered by artificial intelligence applied to social media. We're getting algorithms that are making decisions for us uh, in economics, healthcare, and many other areas, um, sometimes for good, but often uh, not so good, and financial manipulation. So I, th I think I wanna conclude the first question, is AI powerful? The answer is yes, but it's for both good and ill. And I wanna <clears throat> turn, before we think about what that means, I need to turn to those other two questions. Is it intelligent and is it autonomous? So is AI intelligent? It seems like the answer is obviously yes. We call it artificial intelligence. But let's look a little more closely at that. Um, when people have done this, we, they've made a couple of distinctions. One is about general versus specific AI. Um, if you remember the Vargas program that I mentioned in the beginning, it could only do visual pattern recognition. It, it was, you could talk to it all day long and it couldn't do speech recognition. And even in the visual area, it only recognized black and white dots. It couldn't recognize colors, for example. So the question for general AI is, could we build a computer program, let's say, that could play chess at the grandmaster level, but also play checkers? Could it, could it do more than the one thing it was programmed to do? There's a second question, which sounds similar, but it's, it's somewhat different, which is weak versus strong AI. Uh, many people in the AI field worked to think that they were building machines that would show us how the human mind worked, that would help us understand ourselves. Uh, and in that case, AI needed to not just simulate a mind, but actually be a mind. It needed to have competence in some fields, but also comprehension of what it was doing. So weak AI, uh, I could call a library is weak artificial intelligence. It has lots of information in it, but I don't think we, we view a library as a mind. It's not a thinking being. It doesn't know what, what's in the books that it holds within its walls. So the question is, is AI developing that kind of comprehension where it's like, like a human mind? Um, so if you take these two distinctions, strong versus weak and general versus specific, it's, we can place different examples in different quadrants. Um, the Vargas 7 program that I started with clearly is very specific. It only does recognition of black and white patterns. And it's weak in the sense that it used statistics to recognize the patterns in a way that the average person would not do. Uh, it really wasn't a simulation of the mind. What about the artificial intelligence of today? Well, to talk about this, I need to do another example. <clears throat> Let's consider the case of Adam. This is, he's a nine-year-old who's been diagnosed as learning disabled. 
a paper by Ray McDermott does a sort of extensive analysis of what it means to call Adam learning disabled. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Ray McDermott made several observations. Uh, when Adam works with his friend Peter, he can easily make a cake. They mix up the ingredients, they bake the cake, and it's good cake to eat. When he works with others, though, there's often arguments, tears, taunting. He doesn't always do it right. He, he, uh, they see problems. In classroom lessons, Adam gets much worse. Uh, his troubles are more frequent. Um, adults uh, chastise him. Um, this is where the learning disability really shows up. And so then he's sent to the psychologist. And in formal testing sessions, Adam does the worst of all. He fails, he makes wild guesses. He, he just doesn't know how to play that game. So the question, is Adam learning disabled? Well, it turns out it's difficult to answer that question just by looking at Adam alone, for Adam to be the unit of analysis. We also need to look at the context in which Adam performs. And roughly speaking, with some imagined quantification here, we might say that in the testing situation, Adam does very poorly. In the classroom lessons, he does a little better. In cooking club with the other kids, he, he does even better. And in daily life, uh, maybe people often don't think of him as disabled at all. In fact, when he's with his friend Peter, he does quite well. So is he disabled? Well, it depends on the context. Um, but let's look at what happens with artificial intelligence. <coughs> it turns out it's surprisingly easy now to write a program uh, to do testing, which is very abstract, very few context cues. Um, it's more difficult to write an AI program to do classroom lessons, even in third grade. Uh, more difficult still to work in cooking club, which, which has a lot of variation. You use the green bowl one week and the blue bowl the next week, that kind of thing. Um, and daily life, AI fails miserably. So we get exactly the reverse of Adam. Um, Adam does better with more context, more human context, and AI tends to do worse uh, it, the more context cues there are. So back to our little chart, I would say Adam, despite being called learning disabled, he actually has a general intelligence. He can learn all kinds of things. He can learn classroom lessons to an extent. He can do the cooking club. He can play games. He can do a wide variety of activities. His, his knowledge is general, not specific. And of course, it's strong. He learns in a human way, and he it, both his strengths and weaknesses are very much human intelligence. But AI, even AI of 2021, is still very specific. Uh, uh, the answer to the um, Lopez de Montaris question was, no, the, the computer that can play chess can't play checkers at all. Uh, the one that can play Go can't, uh, can't do cooking club. Uh, AI is very specific. And when it solves a problem, it solves it in a way that's strikingly not the way humans do it. It doesn't give us a model of human intelligence. Another way to summarize this is to say that computers have shown themselves to be great for things like automated assembly. Uh, working in a car plant which, with um, hygienic, with um, no dust, with things coming down an assembly line in a very predictable way. Robots can work 24 hours a day and do a better job than people can. But uh, artificial intelligence would be terrible for home repair. I don't know anyone who's even attempted such a thing. Here's an example. Uh, if you've done home repair, I think you'll appreciate uh, why these drawers aren't going to work very well. It's, it's the kind of thing I would do because I'm not very good at home repair. The interesting thing here is that <clears throat> if Adam did this, he might be chagrined to find that he, he couldn't open the drawer all the way because it bumped into the handle of the other drawer. 
but he would very quickly understand what the problem is. He'd understand what needed to be done to fix it uh, because he can use the physical environment to give him cues. He could touch those handles. He can try to pull the drawer out. The, the physical world is part of his thinking. It's part of his mind. Um, the artificial intelligence program that did something like this might just continue to do it and build uh, thousands of drawers a day very efficiently, but not have any idea that it, um, why, why this was not a good idea. So the history of these last 50 years of AI, I think has shown that uh, something quite surprising, and that is the tasks that we thought were very difficult, like um, pattern recognition, um, playing Go, um, uh, <clears throat> natural language communication, um, uh, automated assembly, those kinds of things. Many of those difficult tasks have turned out to be easy for artificial intelligence. At the same time, what we thought were the easy tasks, like um, play with a nine-year-old and, and uh, make a cake, turned out to be quite difficult, if not impossible. Uh, for AI. And the interesting thing here is that Adam is smarter than that. A nine-year-old learning disabled child is much smarter than the best artificial intelligence we have today. Why is this so? Well, we often think of the mind as being located in the brain. And the brain certainly plays a, an important role in what our mind is. But our hands are also an instrument of thought. Uh, think of that drawer that doesn't open. When we touch it with our hands, or when I pick up my coffee cup and I see the handle, it shows me where to pick the cup up. Our senses, our, um, our architecture, the way our house is laid out or an office building, uh, the computers we use, material objects, and perhaps most importantly, our social practices, all of these shape what we call mind. Mind is not something that uh, sits located in one organ in the, in the human body. Um, saying that in just a slightly different way, uh, the mind is a distributed biological and sociocultural function. It, it, it's it's a, something that accumulates information from a variety of sources. Therefore, it's not simply located any one place, like in the brain or the heart, and it's not completely in the possession of any one person, place, or thing. So the conclusion on this about is, is AI intelligence is that AI's power is weak and specific. It's not human intelligence. But let me ask the third question, is AI autonomous? Here's a picture of, um, some women with early bicycles. Um, if you look at the socio, the, the development of the bicycle or any technology, you find that it's, it's not just a technical development, it's a socio-technical. Um, so with the bicycle, for example, there were design issues that of the trade-off of speed versus safety. It was easy to make a much safer bicycle, but it would go so slowly, no one would want it. You could make a much faster one that would be risky. How do you balance those two issues? Um, early on, there were issue about whether women should be riding bicycles and how they could do so wearing skirts. Um, these kinds of issues you see in the various designs of bicycles to this day, uh, how the middle bar is, is positioned, um, uh, the different styles and colors. The, in other words, the bicycle is very is not autonomous. It's it's very much uh, part of our our social world, and this is true for any technology, including artificial intelligence. Its meaning emerges from social practices: how it's constructed, how we interpret it, how we distribute it, who gets who gets to have it, uh, how it gets used, uh, which may be quite different from how it was designed. Uh, this means that AI is embedded in our social relations. It's not autonomous. The idea of the autonomous robot going off and um, uh, 
deciding to start a war to kill all the people on the planet uh, is is not going to happen. Uh, AI is AI might contribute to that kind of uh, holocaust, that kind of war, but it would do it because it's embedded in relations with people who make those decisions. So to summarize my answer to these questions, I would say we've over the last 50 years, we've learned that AI is far more powerful than imagined by either the founders of AI uh, or sci-fi writers uh, and others. But it's not intelligent the way people are, and it's not autonomous. It's not something we can that operates independently of, of human uh, values, biases, uh, power relations. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's own work, he's an philosoph Austrian philosopher, his own work in a way paralleled this kind of understanding about AI. In his early work, he thought, uh, thought of language as a picture metaphor, that a proposition was a picture of something in the world, and that if we understood the logical structure of those pictures, we'd understand the logical structure of the world. Later in his life, Wittgenstein moved to a view that uh, language was not simply a logical thing that went on inside someone's head. It wasn't like Descartes had talked. Uh, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. He, was, he had a private language that operated just inside his head, and he thought he could figure out um, the nature of the universe by just examining the logic within his head. Wittgenstein pointed out that um, actually language is much more rougher than that, more ambiguous, more uh, complex. Uh, we are what we are because we share a common language and common forms of life. And it's participating in those forms of life that uh, gives our life meaning and that uh, uh, relates to what we what we call human intelligence. So in conclusion, and I welcome your uh, comments and questions, um, if AI is more powerful than its founders and sci-fi writers imagined, but its intelligence falls short of that of a learning disabled nine-year-old, and its use is deeply embedded in social relations, which are both have both good and evil inherent in them. Then it's vital for all of us to act as critical, socially engaged citizens, helping to shape the future of AI. The end. So. Um, With that, uh, is the sh screen sharing off? <laughs> yes, it's off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bruce. Um, I mean, yeah, the talk was very sweeping. Um, it was very accessible and also very profound. And though I have been following a lot of, you know, readings in this uh, AI and sustainability uh, domain, but what you have talked today and what you, how you have presented, how you have, um, you know, tied together uh, the, those concepts, I think for me, it was very unique. Uh, so I, I feel like I learned a lot and I think like our, um, our uh, friends today also learned a lot. So now we are going to um, open this for uh, question and answer. So um, so I think like um, anybody can either they can just like raise their hand and ask the question themselves or they can post the question on the chat window. So uh, yeah, we are open to the questions now. Um. Can I ask, um, so actually this is Uttam, but um, showing uh, my daughter's name there. Um, thank you, Professor Bruce. Um, it was wonderful talk and uh, I have learned a lot, uh, a very simplistic way uh, about AI. 
um, with some historical um, backgrounds. Uh, the my questions you have mentioned that um, you know the uh, AI has uh, more power. It is becoming more powerful than the founders of AI thought now, but it is less intelligent. Uh, correct. So I, uh, as we have seen um, in the history, human history, that too much power without intelligent. Uh, in someone like notorious leaders uh, produce tragedy, warfare, and you know all those uh, negative things for humanity. Uh, they did uh, bad rather than the good. So I wonder, you know, what will happen if uh, AI will accumulate lots of power but no intelligence at all, and then do you see there is a chance of misuse or a repetition of that um, what happened in the human history that uh, in coming years the AI do the same? Yes, I do. I, th I think that's exactly the, the concern I have as well. Um, you know, if you think of um, nuclear bombs, we were, we were able to create uh, technologies that had enormous power, uh, but we are moral uh, compass, our moral our dis decision and our, our comprehension of what we had created wasn't, didn't keep up with, um, with that, that power. And I'm not sure it even has today. I think that's still a, a threat that we <laughs> don't talk about much, but it's, it's, it's still out there. And I think the same thing is, is true in AI. We're, we've created these powerful tools. Um, we're happy when our smartphone it gives us the information we need. You know, we like to ask Siri or Alexa or to uh, answer some question, um, but we don't, we, and by we, I mean, we as a society don't <coughs> think enough about what are the consequences of that? And are they always uh, good? Uh, very often they're, they're not. And we have to find a way that ordinary people can be engaged uh, in these, um, in deciding how these uh, technologies are to be used. Um, you know, I have to, people um, sometimes joke that I, I end up quoting John Dewey a lot, but I have to at this point, he had debates with Walter Lippmann in the early part of the 20th century. And Walter Lippmann said, um, in this modern world, this was a century ago, he said, we need experts to tell us about healthcare and the economy and uh, pollution and, you know, ordinary people can't understand these complex things. We need the experts to be the decider. And Dewey said, uh, no, I don't agree. Um, it's true that ordinary people may not understand all of the details of say artificial intelligence, but they are the ones who must be engaged in the, the moral choices and deciding what we value, what we, uh, you know, how, how do we trade off, for example, um, our need for privacy with our need to be protected from crime. So we have all these cameras everywhere and facial recognition that helps us catch the bad guys. I think we all like that. But at, at the same time, we've given up uh, privacy. We have no more um, individual lives. Everything is stored in a computer somewhere. And ordinary people need to be engaged in discussions about what, how to deal with those trade-offs. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so I think you, you raise a very important uh, question that, that we all need to be dealing with. I see some questions in the chat. Should I go to those? Uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, you can uh, just pick and, you know, answer them according to, you know, yeah. So there are like two questions or if you want, you can even combine two questions, you know, and, you know, answer okay. them. So. Yeah, well, here's one about from Arjun about uh, AI ending humanity. 
<laughs> well, as I said, um, Toby Ord in a new book says it's, that's the greatest threat to all of humanity. Uh, I don't think it is in the, in the simple way that we might see in the movies. Um, I love to watch these sci-fi movies about the giant computer takes over. But I, I don't think that's, at least in the near future. Um, but where I think we, uh, we do face very real threats is that um, what if we find that we can uh, fight wars with artificial intelligence and drones and um, uh, other technologies like that, and we think, well, that's a cleaner way to fight a war. Do we end up having more wars? Do, do innocent people get killed more and we don't even know about it? Uh, those are, that's kinds of very real threats that are happening today. Um, what's the role of AI making people happy or unhappy? Um, yeah, it would be great if AI could help us to become a Buddha. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, again, that there is this power in AI that could, um, if it can help us take care of the trivial things in life, uh, uh, that might allow us to focus more on what's important. Um, if it can help us to have better health, it can, there are many ways that AI can make us happier. Um, I get happy just thinking about the uh, planetary exploration and these robots going around Mars and uh, the moon. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's wonderful possibilities along with the threats. Um, oh, the blue brain. Um, I don't know enough about it to have a, a, a good opinion. I, I, I think that in general, though, um, if, if we, we can only go so far by thinking of artificial intelligence as something that sits inside a computer, inside the building, inside one room. Uh, it, um, if, if we're interested in true human intelligence, we need to think of, we'd need to think of a um, computer that's embedded in real life. It has to have the same kind of feelings we have. It has to, um, be hungry, it has to be tired, it has to, um, to love, to participate in social relations. And we're, we're very far from that kind of thing. Um, you know, if you, I was thinking back to the cooking club example where Adam and Peter, the two nine-year-olds can bake a cake. We don't need to tell them, we don't need to tell Adam even if he's learning disabled, we don't need to say, you put the ingredients in the bowl and mix them. You know, don't put the ingredients on the floor. Don't throw the ingredients down the sink. Uh, don't throw them out the window. Uh, the, the physical environment, his friends, all make it very clear to Adam that the ingredients go in the bowl. And if it's a different bowl this week from last week. If it's now a stainless steel bowl and it was a plastic bowl last week, Adam can quickly adjust to that. Uh, his, um, the world helps him decide uh, what needs to be done. If we build an artificial intelligence program, we could build one that could bake a cake, but we then have to, we have to tell it all about bowls all the different kinds of bowls and the function of a bowl. We'd have to tell it about Peter and other nine-year-olds. What if Peter's not there and Anna comes uh, this week to bake, uh, to bake the cake? Uh, the computer needs, would need to learn about all these people, all these bowls, all these ingredients. If you start to think of all the things that you need to build into the computer, uh, it's, it's sort of mind boggling. Uh, the amount of uh, information that's needed. Um, I think in principle, we could, every time you come up with something new, you could say, we'll add that in as well. But um, we're very far from 
understanding enough about, we don't even know enough about what Peter and Adam are doing when they bake a cake. To, we can't describe it. We can't, you could write a novel about it. You, we don't know enough about it to be able to uh, tell uh, artificial intelligence program what it needs to do. The, Adam learns it by participating. Uh, he, his knowledge comes through life, not through, um, through logic. Um, uh, let's see, we hear that Ah, very good question. Yeah, you know, when I, I use this sort of um, bland phrase, social relations, but what social relations have include are things like power, the fact that some people have more goods, more wealth than others. Some countries have more than others. Uh, uh, people have different health, different uh, other um, things. And, um, this, um, there, there's a great danger that powerful people, powerful countries, powerful companies, um, will, you will use that power to accumulate even more power. So the runaway explosion in my mind is not, the immediate risk is not that the computer per se develops more and faster AI, but that the, as you said, the, um, the tech superpowers, the people who are creating these things have, are making decisions in their own best interests, which may not be in the best interests of the larger public, much less, um, as you say in the, in the question about um, people who are uh, toiling in the fields for Dalbot, that uh, that's not even, um, in their uh, realm of thinking. Um, I read a lot of the information that comes out of Silicon Valley and some of it's quite interesting, uh, but a lot of it seems to be very disconnected from the real lives of, of people, um, even people in California. Uh, it doesn't, um, it's people living in a world where they um, um, are, uh, separated from um, uh, the people around them. Um, uh, just a quick story I might share is that um, I knew Will Crowther, who was the um, developer of the first computer adventure game. And it's really the model for virtually all of the video games of today, really go back to the format that he developed. Uh, Will was a great guy. He was he would have been a good friend of any of us, um, but he was not um, a, a social creature, in the, at least as I saw it. He wasn't out in the. Um, um, he he loved to work with the computer, and he wasn't thinking. He didn't need to think about how this developing a computer adventure game would help address. Uh, poverty in the community. And that's fine. I mean, it's fine what Will was doing. Uh, he's a brilliant guy and created um, some wonderful stuff. But we also need people to be thinking about um, issues of, of life in, in the world as we live it. Uh, let me see. Um, Yeah, I think I think this is a case where um, uh, uh, AI could make a huge contribution. You know, climate change is so complex that even people who work in the field can only understand tiny bits of it. Uh, so one person studies uh, warming in the oceans, uh, someone else studies uh, air currents, somebody else studies um, uh, fossil fuel emissions. Uh, putting all that information together is enormously difficult. And we're one of the challenges in, in studying climate disruption is figuring out how do we get all the information together in a useful way. 
and AI could help tremendously with that. Again, it comes down to a choice. How do we want to apply, apply that? Um, uh, and, you know, what if it's in the interest of big energy companies to have us continue using large amounts of energy that add to the carbon content in the air? Um, will they, would they fund the development of artificial intelligence to address climate change in a serious way? Um, another example would be, I think the pandemic has revealed that um, even in the United States, our public health system was, is a disaster. Uh, we have very good doctors who can deal with um, specialized diseases, but we have done very poorly at just the most ordinary basic health care. Uh, artificial intelligence could help with that. It could really help building a better public health system, but there's not much money involved. Uh, who's, who, public health almost by definition is, is um, helping to provide health care to people who don't have much. So how do we, they're not going to fund the AI research. How do we make the decisions to apply AI in ways that, that will make a difference um, to large numbers of people um, in, in healthcare, climate change, each of these areas. Um, often the, the, problem, the problems in these areas are inseparable from the question of um, who's got the power and who's got the, the money to control what happens. Um, well, I think, I think I was, we were thinking along the same lines here, uh, the question about <clears throat> whether AI research is profit driven rather than helping humankind. Um, uh, do things that benefit humans get the same attention as things that make a profit? Well, as long as we have a system that um, uh, rewards companies for uh, doing things that increase profits, uh, I think we're going to see that uh, uh, you know that the president of a company who who would say, uh, "Let's quit, let's quit selling uh, smarter computers or." systems to do such and such which make a lot of money and instead let's devote our efforts to helping humankind uh, let's go into poor countries and provide um, help provide better uh, jobs or better health or better education uh, that person might get fired from their company uh, so the the question uh, ultimately is not purely a technological question. It's not about what could the AI do? Um, how do we make, make it run more efficiently? Uh, how can it recognize bigger patterns than it did before or anything like that? The question is more what kind of society do we want and how do we um, organize that society in a way that, um, that benefits uh, people instead of um, disadvantaging people? I think I'll just add my one question. Uh, um, so I think uh, Professor Bruce made a good distinction that powerful system is not necessarily more intelligent system. And I think we are really confused because the current machine learning tech technologies are very powerful and we are assuming them to be very intelligent. And it really needs the wisdom to distinguish between two and not only the AI system and I think the people who drive this AI and this emerging technology also because they will so much power. We, um, we society also project them to be very intelligent and somehow expect them to do, do the right thing, uh, solve all our problems, you know, like, uh, so, um, 
And even within intelligence, there's kind of a hierarchy in intelligence, right? Okay, some kind of intelligence is deemed more important. For example, logical thinking is deemed more important than, you know, other kind of thinking or being good at math, especially in like, uh, which is very true in Nepal. Uh, like if you are good in math and computer science, you are, you know, uh, assumed to be more intelligent, somebody who might be good at, uh, let's say, um, literature. So, and I think this kind of hierarchy of intelligence is still like causing our technology leaders to be a little bit of uh, uh, not so receptive about other voices. So uh, now, because GS is, we are this interdisciplinary team. So can you tell us like why we need this like interdisciplinary approach in technology so that we are more receptive for the sustainable future? Yeah, very good question. You know, my um, dissertation advisor was a logician and uh, I had people on my committee who were very um, knowledgeable in, in the fields of logic and uh, computer design. And I think a lot of us saw at the time that artificial intelligence would grow out of the field of logic or possibly logic combined with electrical engineering. And many of the computer science departments, the early ones that started up were um, people out of uh, physics, electrical engineering, formal logic, mathematics. And what a lot was accomplished by that approach. Um, I think we ought to recognize that. At the same time, we've, we, we've come to realize that um, intelligence and technologies that benefit humanity need much more than just a logical understanding. So it's like, like the philosopher Wittgenstein who started with logic and then came to see it's really more forms of life that matter. Um, I heard someone say that uh, this was the head of computer science at the University of Illinois. He said, if we were starting computer science today, instead of basing it on formal logic or electrical engineering, I think we should start with literature or arts or um, maybe sociology that tries to understand people psychology. That um, what, as technologies come into all aspects of our lives, we need a better understanding of what our lives are and what we want our lives to be. So that um, we, we, yes, we still need um, the engineers, we still need mathematicians, but the, the experience of the last half century in this area is that what we, what we were leaving out was the human side. We were leaving out the, the things that make us uh, special as humans. And when we do that, we risk these, um, these negative effects. In fact, we're almost bound to get these negative effects because we, there's work involved in becoming um, socially engaged, uh, in becoming critical. By critical, I don't mean negative. I don't mean, oh, I'm anti-AI or I'm anti-computers. What I mean is being, looking at what, what can the technology do for us? What are its dangers? How do we control it? How do we shape its future? And for that, we, we absolutely have to have um, perspectives that come, uh, I would say, definitely from different disciplines. We need that kind of interdisciplinarity. But we also need perspectives that come from different, um, different cultures, from different um, uh, linguistic communities, different genders, different, we need, we, we essentially need life experience. How do we get our life experiences, which are each unique, how do we bring that to bear on the technologies that we're creating? Uh, thank you. So, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bruce. Uh, actually, it's 7 2, so we are past our designated time. But um, if there is any like burning question, maybe we can take, with permission from Professor Bruce, we can take maybe one or a couple of questions. And if there are no questions, I think we are ready to wrap up. So. Um, Otherwise, I'll just like add my one more question. So actually I have a lot of questions, but I'll just like stop at one. So 
um, because I uh, one of the reason we invited you was because you have been uh, you have seen the trajectory you know you have this like a vantage point uh, so you have seen the early enthusiasm you have seen the AI winter you know and all that so uh, and I really think that again not only the, there's a power there's intelligence and there's the wisdom right so we really need wisdom um, so when you absorb the current uh, AI technology or computer science technology field in general um, do you feel uh, relieved that there are this enough wisdom in the community or do you think that or do you feel a little bit anxious that the community as a whole does not have collective wisdom as much as it is needed and it is time that people from other fields have to intervene or for example maybe you you have um you have not been active, you are more into education sector, right? So do you feel the sense of urgency? Like, oh my God, now AI has become so influential. Maybe I should go and intervene and impart my wisdom as well. So what are you thinking about it? Yeah, I think that if you look at recent politics in the US or, or actually many other countries, but I, I see it mostly close to home. I think we, we do not have too much wisdom. We, we have a shortage of wisdom and we, we need to find ways to uh, not only have a broader perspective and understand better, but also learn how to talk, talk to each other better. We need to recognize that everyone needs to be involved in, in, um, in these questions. And uh, so we need much more effort on uh, things like uh, communication, intercultural communication, on um, uh, understanding different perspectives. And um, the, the faster the AI goes, the, the more we even need, need to do that kind of thing. Um, I see a couple other questions here. Let's see. Um, Looks like the same question twice. Okay, um, yeah, I don't have those good examples. I, I, this, I'm not saying they don't exist. I, I just, I'm not as aware of them. Uh, uh, most of what I've seen has been things like some AI or, or computer companies coming into the Global South and providing jobs for some people. Uh, so Bangalore in India, you know, becomes this the huge international center. Uh, and I assume for many people that's provided income and, and uh, prestige and things that are valuable. But I, what I don't see is ways that um, uh, it's, it's provided benefits to large numbers of people. I think it can. Uh, I think we we saw with um, the rapid development of um, vaccines for COVID that some of that came about because of artificial intelligence techniques that were able to do things in weeks or months that used to be years or maybe never. And could we you know, develop other um, vaccines for all the other diseases that uh, many of which are more prevalent in global south than in, in the north, but but we need to find ways to say that uh, the the vaccine developers need to focus on that, even if there's not the same profit in it. So again, it's a social question or a political economy question. How do we how do we get people with the power to focus on where where the greatest needs are? Um, I think. You know, beyond healthcare, there's also ways that um, uh, getting information about um, uh, the economy, job possibilities, uh, uh, better techniques for agriculture. Uh, there are all kinds of, I mean, virtually any area of human activity, uh, I think artificial intelligence gives us a power to be able to improve life, but we have to find ways to uh, direct our attention uh, in that direction. 
yeah, I think, um, so this is a very good um, segue because I also want to announce our next speaker. And I, I, as uh, Professor Bruce mentioned, uh, AI can be used in agriculture. And actually our next speaker is going to talk about this automation and AI in oh. agriculture. He's Professor Manus Karki, uh, and he's uh, speaking on February 24. And he also has a very quite interesting because he grew up in Nepal, uh, the hills of Nepal, eastern hills of Nepal. So till 10th grade, he was doing the plow farming, ox plow farming by himself. So now he's doing, you know, this very state of art research in, um, in, in, uh, AI in agriculture, but again, um, so there is always this like a double-edged sword. Is the automation is going to be helpful or not? You know all this, so we can have all this discourse. So with that note, um, again, um, before you go on, could I, I, I just have a quick comment? Um, sure. I was talking with um, a woman who got an advanced degree, I think a doctorate, uh, uh, in Kathmandu, but through a through a U.S. university, mm -hmm. and she learned all about agricultural techniques and great discoveries, but they were all, um, the research was, much of it was based in the United States. And so the, the program was a very good program. They taught what they knew, which was um, journal articles written in the U.S., uh, research done in the U.S., yeah. uh, crops grown in the U.S., you know. Yeah. That was, that was what they knew. And then she went to work uh, in Tarai and realized mm -hmm. that much of her knowledge was, she, she didn't know how to apply it mm -hmm. in, uh, in her own country, just you know, 100 miles from uh, Kathmandu. And so she, uh, again, it, it's that idea that it, it's knowledge alone is not enough. It's about how we connect it mm -hmm. to where the human needs are. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt, but I just no, no, no. I think that that is a very good insight, and I think the the goal of our webinar series is actually have this kind of you know very uh, holistic, very critical discussions. Not, um, of course, you know, technology um, is awesome and it's awe inspiring. Uh, so it's it's awesome. It's really interesting to talk about the latest of uh, latest stage of the art development, but at the same time. Uh, yeah, as you said, you know, how, how can it actually make impact and not only at certain uh, areas and to certain demographic, but, you know, to, to the world in general. Um, yeah, this is the goal. And um, I can't thank enough uh, for Professor Bruce for again, giving his time and just setting this webinar series in such a nice tone, you know, where you are not only an AI veteran yourself, but, you know, um, who has we has had a very interdisciplinary perspective and and as a good educator you just explained this very profound philosophical concept to us in a very accessible way so uh, thank you so much um, so we are going to uh, we have recorded this it will be on YouTube and uh, for those of our friends who could not join to, to join us today either in zoom or Facebook live you know they can go back and uh, you know watch the videos um, and this is a continued conversation and we are go also going to have uh, uh, proceedings of all our uh, uh, of our, all our talks so of course we'll be um, talking to uh, Professor Bruce again regarding this uh, so now I would ask Professor Bruce to say his final uh, comments and we are going to close our session today well I, I feel very honored to have been invited uh, to participate in this. And I, I really appreciated the uh, questions that you and, and other participants asked, because I think you're, you're asking exactly the right questions. Uh, I, I, wish, I wish I had the answers or that we, I could just point you to where the answers are, but I, I think these are things we, the more challenges uh, to work on rather than things with a simple um, yes or no. Uh, so I, again, I feel, um, grateful for the opportunity and I, I learned a lot and I hope that uh, wish you the best. Uh, okay, now thank you, Professor Bruce. Um, uh, I would also like to thank on behalf of JIS, I would also like, like to thank um, all our uh, Zoom participants and our friends in Facebook Live who are watching this session and I would like to give special thanks to uh, Uttam Babu Shrestha, uh, Director of JIS uh, for handling all the technical uh, stuff uh, for our today's talk. Um, so, okay, thank, thank all of you and good morning, <laughs> good afternoon to Professor Bruce and good evening to everyone. Okay, yeah. bye.